Hello everybody and welcome to the fourth in the series of Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists um, webinars around the practice placements and the pre-registration eating, drinking and swallowing competencies. Um, this is the last in the, this current series and it complements each of the webinars complement the other. So I do recommend you watch all of them, but I would say that wouldn't I, but I do think it would really help. But we are here today to talk in particular about opportunities around the EDS uh, competency framework for working with paediatric placements. And I am very excited um, to be here today to hear what, what is going to be said. Next slide. So for those that don't know me, I am Judith Broll. I'm the Director of Professional Development at the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists. I am a speech and language therapy therapist by background. Um, my clinical background is adult acute and managing services, but has they have included paediatrics, both um, acute NICUs all the way through mental health, um, learning disabilities and community clinics. But um, I think this is a fantastic opportunity to, to take forward the, um, the, the dysphagia piece of the eating, drinking and swallowing opportunities for us as a profession. Um, so I am listening more than talking today, you'll all be delighted to say. But before we get on to hearing what's going on, if anybody has any technical issues, um, please could you contact our fabulous Royal College staff via the chat function. Once the webinar has started, that chat function will not be available for everybody because I think the idea is, is that we all really listen to understand what is being said. But if you have any questions and comments for us, we would really be interested in receiving them by the Q&A button. Um, we will be talking to um, the whole all the questions at the end and we are hoping that we will have some really interesting discussion after hearing our colleagues uh, today. The event will be recorded and once this final uh, webinar has been has been um, uploaded all of them will be available on the website um, and there will be an evaluation form for you at the end which we really appreciate your thoughts and comments um, once we have uh, we have finished today. So without further ado, I would like to um, introduce the people that will be talking in a lot more detail than I will be. We have, I'm delighted to see um, Naomi Bevan, I hope I've said your name right, Naomi, who is a learner and soon to be NQP, the absolute cohort that we are looking to, to support in all of this. And Beverly Curtis, who's a speech language therapist and paediatric dysphagia clinical lead from Cardiff and Vale University Health Board. We also, I'm delighted to say, have Christine Horton with us, who's the Clinical Leading Complex Needing Dysphagia in Lancashire and South Cumbria NHS Foundation Trust, and Paula Leslie, who is a consultant scholar and lead author and the academic lead for the competency framework, and also a clinician as of yesterday as well. So this very esteemed group is going to lead us through this webinar, um, and I'll come back to the questions at the end. So thank you very much. And at this point, I'd like to hand over to Naomi. Thank you. Hi, yeah, I'm, as just been introduced, I'm Naomi, and I've just finished my final year at university training to be a speech and language therapist. So I'm really excited to get stuck into the, the role in September. So I had a dysphagia placement um, in my final year with Bev Curtis. And these pictures perfectly sum up how I felt about my dysphagia placement. I was really upset. I was gutted. I ran upstairs, told my family, I can't believe it. I've got a dysphagia placement. What am I going to do? I was really scared. I was frightened. I was a bit annoyed. And yeah, these I felt really sick. And I think the Kevin McAllister picture really summarizes exactly how I was feeling. And I think it's because the teaching that we had was, I think it's definitely been affected by COVID. All the teaching we had was online. It was, we had all our dysphagia teaching when we first went into lockdown and it was all online. We didn't have any in-person teaching. And I think the teaching generally is very, very different to actual experience. And the teaching we had was quite abstract, I think in some ways it was a lot to it was a lot to take on and I don't think I really understood 
what it what it was like to work in dysphagia because I hadn't had the opportunity and there was a lot to take on I had a lot of anxiety and I think part of it was to do with while all speech and language therapy is important specifically with dysphagia there is this idea that it is around life and death whereas speech and language isn't and this big burden of responsibility so I was absolutely petrified of this placement and I know that dysphagia is above a band five grade or at least was at the time and I thought goodness what is it's above a band five what can I even do on placement I'm going to fail the placement because I've got no clue what I can actually do to meet my placement criteria and demonstrate that I'm somewhat competent so next slide so what worked well on the placement was a few things so the placement structure was six days spread across I think four or five weeks with three hours actually in the hospital with Bev and then three hours at home to do my write up my observations and do a bit of research so I think firstly setting expectations from the start was really important I had a phone call from Bev which was something small but had a really mighty impact it massively reduced my anxieties just letting me know right this is what's expected of you this is how what you're going to need to do this is what we don't expect you to do I'm not expected to do any swallowing assessments or things myself I'm going to be shadowing learning observing writing up and it massively massively helped and I've explained that I'd be doing a lot of observing, writing my own notes, and then at the end of the day, feeding back and discussing with her. And this discussion was so important, having, which goes on to the second point, having that time to discuss and think about what's going on, removes that fear. I had the time then to, to think about the diagnosis, the reason for SLT contact, right, who else is involved in the MDT, and write all this out in a pro forma that Bev had designed. So I'd, I'd write all that down, and then at the end of the day, I'd have a phone call with Bev and discuss it with her. So I'd be able to think about, okay, so in this situation, why did the team make this decision instead of this one? And I could think through it for myself and research, okay, well, they've got this condition, so maybe it's something to do with that and discuss that with Bev rather than it being a, a frightening oh, I don't know why they did this one rather than that ah. so it was it was really helpful to have that time because it's quite it's a very unusual environment to be in it's very very different to any kind of placement that I've had before so I think it's really important to have that time to to process really and I think the last thing is I know it's, it's rather obvious but having the physical placement and being in the environment because the teaching is so, I mean, it's like with any area, the teaching is very different to in practice, but I think more so with dysphagia. I think there's only so much you can learn from teaching, even with videos and photos and discussion. I think that, yeah, even with other areas, this is an area more so than others that you need the experience in to fully understand everything about it. So what could be better? I think with my experience, it was six days in the acute environment and I got to see a lot of acute and informal assessment and discussing the immediate feeding needs of the children that we saw. But there was quite little ongoing management and okay, what happens at three months in this child life or six months or a year? What what happens at that point? There was a lot um, dealing with the immediacy and. I think that feeds into the idea of having experience in different settings, being out in the community and seeing how dysphagia is managed for a child that you've seen at this stage. And then as they go along that journey and managing that. And I think the majority of children that I saw on placement had um, tracheoesophageal fistula and esophageal atresia, which apparently is really rare, but I think the majority of children that I saw in placement had that. So I thought, oh, this is quite a common thing then. And Bev's there going, no, you've just come at a time where there happens to be a lot. So I think having an experience in some different settings and different clinical areas in the community would give, give a bit more of a broad perspective of dysphagia and different conditions that are out there. 
Um, next slide, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, so what changed? I think definitely having this experience, it made me gone from never wanting to work with dysphagia. I said to everyone, I am never touching dysphagia with a barge pole. It's not something I want to go into ever. And after this placement, I think part way through, I was thinking, yeah, I can tolerate this. This is, this is okay. And then by the end of the placement, I thought, you know what, maybe one day I could actually see myself working in this environment, working in this clinical area. And I went from feeling quite inept and thinking, oh, it's, it's all above my head. I don't, I don't understand it all. It's too medical. It's too this. It's way above me. So actually thinking, you know what, given the right support and training, when I, when I am that qualified, yeah, I could work in this. I could be capable of of doing this and I, I went from literally hating it and being terrified of this clinical area and placement to actually feeling like you know what I could one day one day do this and I spoke to another student yesterday who said they feel exactly exactly the same and I know from speaking to people on my course that their their experience is kind of similar they some people really want to work in this area some people really really don't but the people that really don't once we've had this experience they're changing their minds which is really good um next slide fab thank you so this this slide again just really demonstrates my my experience that feeling of going from terror to you know what i got this and i think one, I think the key points for me that I really wanted to emphasize is having this experience massively impacted the jobs I would actually apply for because I wouldn't, if I hadn't had this experience, I would not be applying for jobs in complex needs. I really enjoyed my ALD placement I had in third year, but again, I wouldn't have applied for an ALD post out of the fear of, oh no, it might involve dysphagia, so I'm not going to apply for it. So this experience really has impacted where I where I would apply and what posts I would apply for. And I think for me, one of the big surprises actually was the burden of responsibility that SLTs have. I could not understand how anyone could actually work in dysphagia because I thought, oh, they must be panicked, stressed, off work, sick all the time with stress. How can you work in this clinical area with this crippling burden of fear that the minute if you do something slightly wrong, you're going to cause someone's death, then it must be a terrifying place to work. When actually seeing Bev and one of the other SLTs, at just getting on with their job, it's it's normal. You you know what you're doing, you work in that. They're not walking around constantly upset and, and stressed at, at working in this environment. And that that was baffling to me <laughs> that they could they could work and in, enjoy their job in that environment and I think one of the things for me as well is the that I want to talk about is the inequality of placements because I've I've had a dysphagia experience and I know a couple of other students have had dysphagia experiences on placement but there are some students that I know would have loved a dysphagia placement and haven't got one and I think that's that's really sad because I think I think everyone needs to, because it is an area that I don't think you can learn on paper. You really do need that experience. Even if it's a small part of placement, I do think it's really, really important. And yeah, if I had if I had the chance to work in this area as a rotation, I would jump at the chance. Whereas, yeah, previously I would have gone, no, please don't put me there, please. I'll never work there. <laughs> so it's, this experience that I've had has massively impacted my career opportunities and where, what areas I can see myself discussing and working in. And yeah, it's, it's been really, really positive. So thank you for letting me ramble on a bit. So I'd now like to introduce Bev Curtis, who is the SLT at, oh, I think it says it on the slide there. So over to Bev. Thank you, Naomi. That was so lovely to hear your enthusiasm for your um, <clears throat> for your placement. Um, and that's why we're all here, I guess. So my name is Bev Curtis. I'm a speech and language therapist at the Noah's Ark Children's Hospital for Wales. Um, 
and I'm clinical leave for paediatric dysphagia. I'm going to be talking to you today about um, providing paediatric placements, the, some of the um, opportunities that we may have, some of the challenges we may face. I'll be describing how we in Cardiff and Vale, working with Cardiff Metropolitan University, have been supporting our EDS learners and some of the things that we found helpful and thinking about how we can improve this in the future. So next slide, please. Thinking first about opportunities, an increasing number of children are surviving with complex continuing health needs, which includes EDS difficulties, and our understanding of EDS difficulties is improving. With that has come an increased demand for more SLT in this area. There's an appetite for this training. Um, the, the learners want EDS skills, and we're recognizing that we need our learners to emerge from the universities capable of doing this work. There are a wide range of opportunities for EDS exposure um, in many paediatric placements, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. And I know that Christine's going to talk about more. And in general, I think that paediatric SLTs working in dysphagia are enthusiastic and want to share their knowledge and skills. But there are challenges. There are undoubtedly only a small pool of dysphagia trained PEs. We've got increasing numbers of learners. Um, it seems as though paediatric dysphagia SLTs are desirable because we keep being poached into management positions and actually quite a few of us are getting on a bit now. Uh, the new competencies will of course place additional demands, um, particularly for coordination I think. Um, and we need to try, uh, to try to help our learners gain exposure to multiple patient groups. Naomi talked about how important that would be and how it would have improved her experience. Um, which is a challenge for us. And of course, in terms of, in terms of maintaining competencies, there are currently very few opportunities for um, peds dysphagia work at band five. Next slide, please. So thinking about what we've been doing here in Cardiff and Vale, um, working with Cardiff Metropolitan, we provide a placement across one of three settings, which includes um, either preschool complex needs, which is a couple of children's centre settings, some special schools, and the acute setting, which is an, an acute tertiary children's hospital. We provide paired placements, COVID permitting, and these are separate dedicated dysphagia placements during the block, um, which happened in addition to weekly placements. Naomi's placement was unusual. It was because of COVID that she had the six sessions. Um, the positives, I think, are that certainly pre-COVID, we were able to offer the minimum 10 hours to each learner. Um, placements were also provided by other health boards in Wales, not just Cardiff. Um, one of the pluses is that it's the acute team here who provides the teaching, the undergrad peds dysphagia teaching at Cardiff Metropolitan, um, ideally in person, but we've had to do it online recently obviously but that means that we know what the students have been taught which is helpful and now because of bursary scheme most NQPs are required to actually stay in Wales for two years so during their student learning years we get to know them and they get to know us but there are undoubtedly negatives I think as Naomi mentioned the opportunities are very unequal and also limited in range and everybody's concerned really about the increase in learner numbers and the demand this is going to place on uh, the PEs. Next slide, please. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we found helpful, but I am mindful that there's great innovative work um, in supporting EDS learners happening throughout the UK. Um, so I was a little bit hesitant about doing this, but I just thought, well, I'm a great believer in sharing and learning together. So here are just some suggestions for things that we found useful here. Um, I'm not suggesting that everybody else hasn't been doing these things as well and probably a lot more. Anyway, telehealth, we've found over the last 17 months that telehealth has been very useful. Um, so learners can join virtual consultations, meetings, training, etc. Um, and I know Christine's going to be talking in more detail about this. 
uh, certainly it's here to stay. Having a rainy day kit of EDS activities, this, um, pediatric related for filling in gaps is such a useful resource and always having a backup plan for schools so that we can um, manage when children are unexpectedly absent. Spending time with other members of the MDT, um, particularly dietetics, and we have to be flexible, really flexibility has got to be built in because most SLTs, in, certainly in Wales, work not only in EDS, but also with, with children with communication needs. So there's got to be flexibility. Um, Naomi mentioned that we've been using the short day model um, where the learners spend um, a morning in face-to-face -face contact with, um, with the children. Um, and then have some time for some reflection and some guided independent learning with a check-in later. And we use the proforma to guide those, guide the, the, the learners thinking, um, guide their reflections, and then have some time later on to, to discuss. I think um, a whole day of face-to-face -face contact is just too intense and the, the learners need a bit of time to process. Certainly, that, that's the feedback we've, we've been getting and Naomi clarified, but that's how she felt as well. It's really helpful if learners can access the electronic health record, certainly in the community, to gather information and access case notes. We like to provide some advance notice for background reading and, uh, and we provide this pre-placement phone call, which I hadn't realised until Naomi told me was so important in allaying fears and being able to provide reassurances and uh, clarification about expectations. We'll certainly carry on doing that. Next slide, please. So thinking about what we might be able to do in the future to improve the situation. We've been, work, we've been continuing discussions with Cardiff Met about bringing the eating, drinking, swallowing teaching earlier into the, uh, the course programme. And I think we need to be highlighting to all our paediatric SLTs um, <clears throat> that most paediatric placements can include or will include some potential EDS opportunities for exposure and maybe maybe meeting some competencies. I think this is really important thing to uh, we can take forward. Um, Christine's going to talk more about this in terms of the actual competencies that can be addressed by all paediatric SLTs, not just the dysphagia trained. Um, we're going to be delivering some bite-sized recorded training for our peds SLTs. Um, the aim will be to yes provide some red flags for situations that does need a dysphagia trained SLT but also to demystify and to highlight how all our SLTs can contribute to the training of our future um, workforce both in communication and in eating drinking swallowing. Um, we will be expecting our learners to take responsibility but I think that's probably standard now in terms of identifying gaps in competencies. We're going to try to provide placements in two out of the three EDS settings. Um, and Naomi will be very pleased to hear that for our band five starting in September, um, EDS supported EDS work in all three of our potential EDS settings is going to be included in the rotation which we're very delighted about and, and do recognise that that's not something that is going to be possible in, in, in some organisations. Um, really, it's just about prioritising, isn't it? It's about prioritising our future workforce, investing now um, for the future gain. And we will be able to scale this rocky cliff together and we will emerge at the top better. And that's all I've got to say. So I'll introduce Christine next. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, my name's Christine Horton, and I work for um, Lancashire and South Cumbria NHS Foundation Trust. Um, and I'm actually a clinical lead for paediatrics. And I just thought I'd show you some nice pictures of Lancashire because we've, we've had a bit of bad press recently around COVID. So you can see that we are a mixture of rural and um, towns and cities um, with quite high levels of deprivation in quite a few of those towns. Um, so we do get a very, very complex caseload coming through. Um, we're split into two localities and each locality has three teams and each team has 
three or four specialist EBS therapists, but there are quite a lot of therapists that aren't specialists who will come across children who've got EBS problems. So that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I know when I sort of when it came to the attention of the specialist therapists in our teams that the students were going to be expected to do EDS on their placements, they all felt a bit like this at first. And I must admit, I did because we we needed some clarification. We thought, oh my goodness, we've got to offer EDS placements on top of everything else that we do. But as I've talked to people and listened to these webinars, I've realized actually it's just going to be business as usual. Um, next slide, please. So the sort of questions that the staff were asking me was, do we need to offer separate EDS placements? Well, I'm not EDS trained. How can I support the students? Um, what if I don't get any EDS referrals when I've got a student? They're all um, really good questions, which I, I decided to sit down and have a think about. Um, and I realized that actually we could answer all these questions quite easily. Uh, next slide, please. So I thought what's already happening um, for us as therapists offering student placements? Well, our local HEIs have been delivering basic EDS training staff for a long time. And actually members of our staff have actually delivered that training. Um, so we've got a good idea what training they were having. Um, but actually there was no credit for that training really. They weren't expected, the students weren't expected to do EDS on their placements and, and there was no way of recording that they'd had any experience of EDS. So I'm, I'm really excited that now we've got a way of showing the, that the students have had that experience. Um, learners on placement and member of our specialist team, they would get involved in EDS cases, especially if they were with me, they could be doing a VEF one week, they could be on the ward the next week, they could be sat on the floor in a family's house the next day, they might end up in training sessions. We've had um, students who've actually attended some of our post-grad training sessions. So they, yeah, definitely we're getting lots of experience, but I could say no credit. But then I thought, well, what about initial appointments? Do they get experience with initial appointments? And yes, they do, because actually when our staff are taking case histories, there is a question about feeding and when you're doing the case history. So they are being exposed to thinking about eating, drinking, swallowing, and if you like the pre-referral, the universal population. And um, we all like to think, oh, EDS is a specialist thing, but actually eating, drinking, and swallowing is something that every child on our caseload does every day, at least three times a day. So it's it's not a special thing. We all do it. So um, I think it's important to remember that actually. It's like we all communicate, we all drink and swallow. Um, all clinicians have a basic knowledge of eating, drinking and swallowing. And actually all our clinicians need to know that because if a parent does highlight a concern or something, they need to know what to do. They need to know who to talk to. They need to know what the referral process is, or they might actually need, just need to know who to send that parent to speak to or what website that parent needs to look at. It's going to be great that we can take into account their experiences on placement and they have that evidence. I think that's really important um, because it helps when they're applying for jobs. You know, if I if we get if I'm interviewing band fives and they 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 give me some idea of what EDS experience they've got, I'm thinking, yay! When this lady comes to join or gentleman comes to join us, I can maybe consider them as a post grad training person. Next slide, please. So then I thought, how can we enhance the support we're already giving for competencies and COVID has been quite hard for us in the Northwest. We actually haven't come out of lockdown yet in one form or another. So very quickly, all our clinicians had to adopt a hybrid service and our IT department did an amazing job giving us digital access, electronic records in a very short space of time. And I just want to give a big yay to that. Um, the team work across a broad, broad selection of cases. No one is a specialist in one area. We have clinical leads who are highly specialist and we have therapists who are interested in areas, but you just take what comes through the door that day. 
Um, with COVID, we started using videos to watch and discuss, discuss cases, and it's given us a real, um, wow, is that what's really happening when we're not there? Because of course, the moment you're in a parent's house or they're sitting in your clinic, they're on their best behavior. But when you get the video, you see all sorts of interesting things you wouldn't have seen before. So videos are here to stay. Um, our students have actually had an opportunity to either watch live appointments by telemedicine um, because we can set it up in the corner and, and they can sit on the shelf and watch what's happening. Um, opportunities to take case studies by phone as well as in person. Opportunities to triage referrals because they can access our, our um, referral system now remotely. Um, they can even just join an appointment on Teams. Um, and they can access the clinical records remotely. All these things have just been enhanced since we've got more digital access. So now we can actually offer enhanced EDS experience because the students, the learners can actually access our EDS clinics remotely. Um, they can be sat on um, WhatsApp when we're in a VF if they can't come to the VF because we've already got too many people there. They can support the training into special schools or MD colleagues via Teams. Um, they don't actually need to be in the room anymore. Um, we can do study sessions by Teams. We, we can actually bring all our learners together that we've got on placement in the trust at any one time and run a little case study session or um, having a look at VFs online. We can do that all by Teams, where previously, before COVID, we couldn't have done that. So there's lots of really wonderful opportunities at the moment um, to make these EDS experience on placements really valuable and really worthwhile. Uh, next slide, please. So I thought, let's think about an initial appointment. In our trust, every clinician is expected to offer a certain amount of e um, initial appointments every month. This is because we've done lots of work looking at what our um, referral rates are and what, how many initial appointments we need to offer every month to, to um, maintain our waiting list. So every clinician will be doing initial appointments. So every learner will be sitting in on, on initial appointments, either in person or remotely. So I then went through and the numbers beside each of these bullet points, that is one of the competencies that a learner needs to complete by the end of their study at university. And you can see there were actually six that could be met without ever sitting in with a specialist EDS therapist. So when they're taking the case history, they are asking questions about feeding. So there is an opportunity to actually begin to understand the role of feeding in that case history and the importance of that to the service user um, and the family and how they feel about it. Obviously, they've got access to case history and referral information, paediatrician letters, so they can identify information in the case history. And, you know, did this, this, was this baby premature? Were they in NICU? Did they need NG feeding for a while? Did they manage breast or bottle feeding? That kind of information is in the case history, whether the child goes on to have to have follow-up feeding um, support or not. Um, every initial appointment, the opportunity to do an oral facial and they should be doing loads they should be ticking that box like a hundred million times because it's it's a basic skill everybody needs to do so um yeah we can tick that box every time and then when you're taking detailed case histories if you're asking those open questions and the so what questions you're going to start understanding um the family, the carers, or even with older, older um, service users, their perspective on any EDS difficulties they're having. The other thing, um, and it comes up quite regularly, is safeguarding. I think we always need to keep in mind that actually eating, drinking, and swallowing difficulties can, um, often tips into safeguarding discussions. And it's also something we've been talking about actually yesterday in our team is where does an eating, drinking, swallowing difficulty stop and when does it become an eating disorder? And there's a huge link between eating disorders and safeguarding. So, yes, again, probably at least once every, every placement, you're going to end up in safeguarding discussions 
where EDS difficulties are part of that discussion. And that's really important because, you know, safeguarding has to be at the forefront of our minds all the time. Again, um, the, the opportunity to talk to your practice educator and sort of say, well, these, this um, EDS difficulty this parent was talking about, do we need to do something about it? And talking about, well, do we need to, to ring Christine? Do we need to ring one of the other members of the team? Do we need to think about contacting the health visitor? You know, begin to think about all the other members of the um, multidisciplinary team that might be able to help that parent if it's not necessarily a referral into the specialist service. Um, and it might just be signposting to, to a website or something. But there is that opportunity to formulate that whole hypothesis and out, outline possible treatment with a lot of the initial um, appointments that um, the learner is going to be sitting in on. So I think when, when we first thought, oh my goodness, what is going on here? Just sitting back and thinking, actually, we do talk eating, drinking, swallowing difficulties all the time, but we don't actually correlate it with a difficulty. It's just part of how that child or family present when they come to an initial appointment. Um, next slide, please. So I'm hoping that the clinicians, my clinicians now are dancing in the rain. I certainly am. And I'm hoping that the learners at the end of their placements with us um, will also be dancing in the rain, a bit like I think Naomi might have been doing. Um, because what I'm hoping is we can offer really enriched placements. We already share students. It's very rare for one clinician in our trust to have a student for their whole placement. I usually have them for one day of their placement anyway, but we do move them around. Um, there is an expectation that we will be taking more learners this coming um, year. So we, we've got to be novel in our thinking about how we can support the placement and give them that EDS experience. But um, I was talking to the in the supervision session yesterday and, the, and one of the pushers said, how much experience do they need over the course of their degree? I said, well, 10 hours. You said, well, they get that every time they see me. So I think we might find that, that we, we kind of breach that 10 hours because um, that really is only three face-to-face -face appointments by the time um, we've done everything else around that case. But from, for instance, if someone's with me and they're on um, a four week block, they're probably getting five hours on that four week block already. Um, so yeah, it, it's not an insurmountable. It's not as scary as we thought as clinicians. And um, I'm hoping that the placements we offer will make our, our learners smile the way that Naomi was when she was talking about her placement. Um, so yeah, next slide please. I think that's me. And I'm now going to introduce you to Paula Leslie, who's a consultant, scholar and lead, and was really pivotal in writing this competent framework. And then is now a clinician in our wonderful trust, which is amazing. We're really pleased to have her. So over to Paula. Thank you. And it was quite coincidental, my little move. Um, so hello, everybody. Some of you will have heard me talk on this topic before and some of you won't. So there might be a little bit of um, reinforcement, not repetition. Um, this is not just an academic exercise. This is a philosophical move for the profession. For quite some years now, our mission statement and the expectation of other healthcare professionals is that we will support people with communication and um, I prefer the term eating, drinking and swallowing, not just swallowing needs. That is what an SLT is expected to do. And so we can no longer say, oh, I don't do EDS or I don't do dysphagia, I don't do this, that and the other. Um, in the same way that none of us would ever say, oh, I don't do voice, I don't do um, transcription, I don't do people with cancer or any of the other phrases that we might bat around. We all develop our expertise in certain areas as we go along. And um, we also know who to refer to. We know when to spot a problem in any of the given areas, right? Now, I know that when I was first working um, 20 years ago, the, the paediatric um, dysphagia expert literally had, had a barbed wire fence around her caseload and you couldn't even get in to observe, right? And that's 
kind of how it was felt. Um, and so we have this maybe, you know, for those of us that trained a while ago, this, this thought that you need to be a dysphagia specialist and it's so much different to the rest of our profession and all the rest of it, but it isn't. And an important part of thinking about this is that we, we are supporting people with eating, drinking and swallowing problems. Um, and I'm just going to pick up on some points um, really in the order that the speakers raised them that kind of resonated with me and some of the other webinars that we've that we've um, had. So Naomi talked about teaching being very different to experience. And that's why these hours of exposure, which are completely separate to competencies, are so crucial. You can develop all sorts of competencies in, in an educational setting but it's very difficult to translate that into the, the actual lived in experience that we need to observe and hear about and discuss with our service users and their families. Um, I love this idea. And certainly, you know, in my early years, dysphagia was life and death, but eating, drinking and swallowing isn't. And that's partly why the language is so important. We all, almost all of us, eat, drink and swallow. It is something that everybody does. And it's very important, not just for that bio, biomechanical medical model of fuel and a body, but for our identity, the things we eat show, show who we are, where we come from, how we connect with other people across um, geographies and across time. So, and then this is really interesting. Naomi said, this really affected which jobs people apply for. And I think, I think that that resonates with all of us. We know the placements we've loved and we've know, we all know the placements that we hated. And that really did color our thought about future professions. And that really maps with where this work came from. Part of where this work came from was employers coming to us, pediatric employers coming to college, I should say, saying, you know, in the early days of COVID, um, we need you to help us. And we, we need people with more experience in eating, drinking, and swallowing. And we really need them in pediatrics. And we need them generally in pediatrics. And Bev talked about, um, you know, we've got this, this beautifully maturing workforce that may have a lot of experience in eating, drinking and swallowing side, but, but we've got a um, plan for the next, the next generation coming through. And, and I don't think they're as scared as we were of dysphagia when we trained 20 odd years ago, and it wasn't on our, on our hit list as it were. Um, Bev also talked about um, that preparation for cases um, counts for hours and it does in exactly the same way as it does in communication. So if you are a clinician, you don't have to have a hundred cases all spe um, specifically focused on eating, drinking and swallowing within the pediatric realm and all the hours have to be face to face. They, the hours have to be related to a case that someone's working on and I'm hoping that this is going to um, allay, I think it was Emily Keefe's question you know a lot of their acute dysphagia gets sent off to a hospital there's a specialist workforce that deals with them blah 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 and and what happens if you have students and you don't have these cases or they all get shunted off somewhere and and you can't fulfill the hours um, and again we're only talking about 10 hours but the the case management and the experience of the clinicians being able to talk about a child that they've seen um that's had to go on for more specialist work elsewhere, that early preparatory and exploratory work around eating, drinking, and swallowing issues all counts um, in terms of these 10 hours. Uh, Beverly also mentioned allaying fears. Um, and this, this first phone call is really important. We have rock solid evidence in the trauma literature that cognitive, the cognitive processes that kick in when people are scared severely impair their ability to learn. And that is exactly the same when you are a brand new shiny student or you're a brand new shiny clinician of some years experience who rocks up to a clinic yesterday and we've got electronic health records and we've got this, and we've got abbreviations and we've got terms. And I'm just sat there looking at the person I was working with thinking, oh, well, I'm just going to write everything down that you say. And then I'm going to ask you again next week when I come back. I'm just warning you now. Um, so anything we can do to allay fears really helps our learners of any length experience pick up new stuff. Um, Christine also um, talked about the interprofessionality or the multidisciplinarity of eating, drinking and swallowing issues. 
And I know in the HEIs, this is like a big, a big button within the HEIs individually, um, the HPC requirements for accreditation, you have to show lots more interprofessional learning experiences now. Um, sometimes just to check a box and keep that university or HEI happy. And I think eating, drinking and swallowing, maybe more so than many areas of communication, really lends itself to this interprofessionality. Because really in the communication side, we are, you know, very much the experts and very much unique. We may have some help from psychology and from, you know, one or two other disciplines, but it's, it's often harder to show interdisciplinarity in those areas, whereas eating, drinking and swallowing, it's, that's how it is. It is not a unidisciplinary area to work in. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping that I've addressed uh, Emily's issues there. A couple of other things that have come up um, over time, <laughs> a very specific question. Why 10 hours and not 30 hours in paediatrics? Well, we wanted to keep it to 40 hours under face-to-face -face, uh, because that's kind of in line with post-basic training. But I'm pretty certain if we went out and said, right, we'll have 30 paediatrics and 10 adults, you know, a load of people would just pass out. A load of clinicians would just pass out. 2020, I don't, you know, we didn't really think was was appropriate either. So 1030, then we come to nice round numbers. Um, because often or historically, we're more used to getting placement and exposure within the adult um, services. So let's start. This is our first iteration of this change for the profession. Let's start with a little bucket of pediatric hours and a slightly bigger bucket of adult hours and see how we go. And if in the future, it turns out that those pediatric folks saying, actually, we can do loads of hours within the pediatric setting. Well, that's great, that's fantastic. We can change things as we go along. Um, what do we mean by pediatrics? We mean exposure to any person under 18 who has any issues with eating, drinking and swallowing or a condition that might lend itself to eating, drinking and swallowing, even if what we're working on it are, are communication issues. Um, I'm not gonna talk about um, graduation and endpoint expectations. There is a document about that, but please rest assured, we do not expect any graduate coming out in three, four, five years time to walk into a job and run a NICU and run, and I, I love the, um, the automatic dictation here, came up with um, knickers, I think earlier on, I thought that's fantastic, um, pediatric knickers. <laughs> so um, we're not expecting that in the same way that we don't expect someone to walk out and be an expert in any other area within that newly qualified year while they're just finding their feet. They'll have some exposure and they can be supported in terms of their wishes and the services demands to become a specialist in, in whatever area is appropriate. Um, and I really would encourage people to think that these 10 hours and the 30 adult hours should, should come across as many placements as possible. And actually we on the, on the author committee were quite against looking for dysphagia or even EDS placements because it's not a special thing in and of itself. It is an experience and a difficulty that almost all of our populations that we work with may have at some time. And, and that normalizes things. So on that, I'm going to stop talking and hand over to Judith. Thank you. And thank you to all our fabulous panelists. What a fascinating uh, discussion that we were having virtually there and just hearing about the great work and innovation that's already out there and the really creative ways of, of, of meeting this. And I think I was looking at all the questions and thank you for answering some of them online already. And I just wanted to pick up on a couple more themes, if I may. Um, I think what I'm really interested in hearing is, is how, how the thinking about how having EDS exposure right from pre-registration is really changing the way. I really love what you said, Naomi, about it opens your options to the profession. And I think that is one of the really big drivers that we were very keen on quite early on. And when the working group who wrote this, and it absolutely wasn't college, this was a working group of the, the great and the good, that's exactly what they wanted to do. And I think it would then really help. I've been having discussions regionally with people working sort of in the world you're in, Bev, saying we are running out of clinicians. We have 
too much demand and not enough people and enough bodies. So this is really timely. And we know that does take time to make, to, to, to coin a phrase, you can't knit a NICU therapist and you can't knit somebody to go and work in complex paediatric dysphagia in the community overnight. But if we can move the goalposts to start having that discussion, I think within a time frame that will really help um, with, with the whole piece. Um, Something else I think that you said, Christine, which really resonated with this whole piece about putting the holistic lens on this EDS piece was how you have to think not just about EDS, not just about communication, but actually about safeguarding as well. And those really bigger ticket items that maybe might not be allowing learners at the moment to join dots, but making it really real by having that and also capturing that time. I know we're all doing it in our clinical settings at the moment. That's really important, but nobody's getting the, the QDOS for it. And there's something I just wanted to say is that we are working to put a log in place so that these hours can be nationally logged by students in whatever whizzy form. Clearly, I'm a dinosaur. I don't understand it. And we're going to put a small working group together to think about how we can do this. Ideally, we'd like to align it with a CPD diary for our CSLT and HCPC to add that piece in but I absolutely hear you that at the moment you guys are doing it Naomi you did it beautifully and where are those hours captured how can we show how can we prove it and this is about evidencing stuff that we are already doing so I think this is a really good opportunity as Paula said there's already fact sheets out there about how to log an hour what an hour is which will really feed into how to log it there is, and, and as you were saying, Christine, we, already, we are already triangulating what we're doing now. And there is a document saying what needs to be done face-to-face, -face, what could be done face-to-face, -face, and also what could be done in HEIs. And we're going to be looking at what simulation needs. We're going to have some, some work done around simulation to support this work. And I think something that you said, Bev, which I'm really delighted to hear, and I'm sure is happening right across the country, is I'm hoping that this piece of work will help HEIs and clinicians to really work it much, even if that's possible, even closer in tandem with this piece of work. I know there already people are, but it's also an opportunity to invite that dialogue so that everybody makes this really transparent who's doing what, and that will really be different um, in, in different different clinical areas all around. Um, I, I'm just looking at the questions. Is there anything else that any of the panelists would like to comment on rather than me wobbling on? Or is that is that anything else from there? Did I see your hand go up, Bev, or is that you just scratching? Apologies all around if it was. I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, I think that the other piece, if I will keep wobbling, is um, we have just about finished a, another document that is coming out, which will really help, I think, the clinicians on the ground, which is about the endpoint expectations of what we're expecting these students to come out with. I think going back to what Paul was saying about, you know, they're not coming out to work on paediatric NICUs or NICU, they are going to come out with skills that are useful, because otherwise, why are we doing this for the profession if they're not going to be useful, these new grads? But equally, to have a then to have a dialogue with that individual about where that can go for that individual moving forward. Ultimately, we as a professional body are going to be looking at the current um, competency framework, which I think needed a review a few years ago and then didn't happen for various reasons. And in light of this, because we've moved the goalposts of where this work starts, it's not all going to be postgraduate from now on. We're going to move that understanding and exposure into pre-registration. There is going to be a need to review all the other bits of the framework, which I think is really timely. We need to land what we're doing now, and then we can go from there and see what the rest of it looks like. And I'm really interested in talking to everybody on this call and all the um, and all of you out there in, in, in webland about what is needed. Personally, I'd like to align it against four pillars. I'd like to align it against other pieces of work to make it a much more useful 
dynamic document. How do we start training a NICU therapist? And I'm really delighted to hear that band five, and you're absolutely right, Bev, we need to start thinking about band five jobs in this area, not just thinking of them as super specialists at band seven. It's almost too late. So thinking about the whole career for this especially around paediatrics, because I think it is a really growth area and an interesting area, Naomi, as you're now telling us. So there is something about this is the start of a journey. I know I keep saying that and my colleagues keep rolling their eyes, but I think it is. And it's something we would we should all be doing together. Christine. Yeah, it was just on that point about training therapists at Band 5 to do NICU, to go on the wards. Um, and I think that's really important because when we look at our data for referrals for EDS, something like 60 to 70% of our referrals are not to five years. And of that, the majority are under two. And I know when I've been training staff post-grad, they're quite scared of NICU, they're quite scared of babies. So I'm hoping that, that if we're getting that training in the HEIs for our learners, they're going to come out and they're not going to be so terrified of seeing a baby or, or going into a hospital ward where there's noises and beeps and things. Because I think actually waiting till you're a band seven, often band sevens have a lot of other responsibilities and, and we need people to be able to pick up those babies in the community once, they, once they're competent to do it, once they've had that exposure and to be comfortable doing it. It's a really good point, Christine, and that's something I think we need to think about in terms of influencing our, our workforce higher up. You're absolutely right. Now, there was another question come in that Paula said you'd like to answer. Yeah, so um, thanks, Laura Keeling, private company. I'll read this out in case people can't see it. We have a tiny EDS caseload, but often have the odd EDS visit during our general placements. Could these count towards their overall hours? Or should experience hours only be gained during EDS specific placements? Right? This is the whole point. All of our people eat, drink, and swallow, no matter what we're seeing them for. So absolutely, this is this is the the idea of the of the log that people might get all 10 hours in one placement or more, but they might get three hours here um, in a community setting, two hours in a private company, um, three hours or five hours in a hospital setting. And that's great. Little bits from more placements um, enable us to situate the EDS issue in, in the whole person and the whole um, type of life that they may be living, whether that is in a hospital or seeing them at home or as an adolescent in school. So absolutely. And that's what the what we're uh, if I'm involved in designing the log, I've been in preliminary discussions. This is the idea of the log that we can that we, people can chart where they've seen things and not just counting hours, but showing the breadth of situations or conditions or ages that they've worked with. Thank you. That is brilliant. Now, this is such an interesting topic. We could talk on and on, but I've been given a two minute warning. So um, what I would like to say is that any other thoughts or comments that we have not been able to answer or you can think of in the future, please do send them through. What we are planning on doing is to reviewing all the questions and we are going to do some some, some feedback and email out to everybody um, from now on in. So um, I think is there a final slide? colleagues that I need to prove or am I going to just say thank you to our wonderful um, speakers today to Naomi to Bev to Christine to Paula it has been a fascinating and really helpful webinar I personally learned a lot I'm very ex excited now I hope everybody on this webinar um, also enjoyed it um, thank you all for your attention we look forward to the next step in this process and uh, Thank you very much and, uh, and goodbye. Take care all. <laughs>